to be an alien. Part 2 Less important rules and some special examples. Chapter 16 A Bloomsbury Intellectual Bloomsbury intellectuals do not want to look like each other, so they all wear the same clothes. Brown trousers, yellow shirt, green and blue jacket. They also like purple shoes. They choose these clothes very carefully to show that they do not think clothes are important. It is terribly important that the B.I. always has a three-day beard because shaving is only for ordinary people. Some B.I.s think washing is only for ordinary people too. At first it is quite difficult to shave a four-day beard so that it looks like a three-day beard, but with practice a B.I. can always have a perfect three-day beard. To be a Bloomsbury intellectual you must be rude because you have to show day and night that the silly little rules of the country are not meant for you. If you find it is too difficult to stop being polite, to stop saying hello and how do you do and thank you, etc., then go to a Bloomsbury school for bad manners. There you can learn to be rude. After two weeks you will not feel bad if, on purpose, you stand on the foot of somebody you don't like as you get on the bus. Finally, remember the most important rule. Always be different. Only think and talk about new ideas. This is not difficult. Just think and talk about the same new ideas that other Bloomsbury intellectuals think and talk about. Chapter 17 Mayfair Playboy Put the little word DE in front of your name. This makes people think that you are important. I knew a man called Leo Rosenberg from Graz who called himself Lionel de Rosenberg and everyone thought he was an Austrian prince. Understand that the most important thing in life is to have a nice time, go to nice places and meet nice people. Now, to have a nice time you must drink too much. Nice places are great hotels and large houses with a lot of music and no books. Nice people say stupid things in good English. Unpleasant people say clever things with a bad accent. In the old days the man who had no money was not a gentleman. Today in Mayfair things are different. A gentleman can have money or borrow money from his friends. The important thing is that even if he is very poor he must not do useful work. Always laugh if someone says something amusing. Be polite, but do not be serious. Laugh at everything that you are not intelligent enough to understand. Don't forget that your clothes, your trousers, ties and shirts are the most important things in your life. Always be drunk after half past six p.m. Chapter 18. How to be a filmmaker. To become a really great British filmmaker, you need to have a little foreign blood in you. The first thing a British filmmaker wants to do is to teach Hollywood how to make good films. To do this, you must not try to make films about American subjects. Here is the subject for an American film. Do not use it. A young man from Carthage, Kentucky,
who can sing beautifully, goes to town. After many difficulties, he becomes New York's most famous singer. At the same time, he falls in love with a poor girl who works in a local shop. She is very beautiful, but nobody knows that she also has the best voice in the city. She helps her lover when she sings a song in his theater in front of six million people. The young and very famous singer marries the girl. Here is an example of a serious and deep American film. A happy but very poor young man in New Golders Green, Alabama, becomes very rich selling thousands of machines to other poor people. The richer he becomes, the more unhappy he is. Everybody knows that money cannot make you happy. It is better to be poor and have no job. The young man buys seven big cars and three airplanes and becomes more unhappy. He builds a large and beautiful house and is very, very unhappy. When the woman he has loved for 15 years finally says she will marry him, he cries for three days. This story is very deep. It has soul. To show the film has soul, the cameraman takes interesting and surprising pictures of the film stars. He takes photographs of the bottom of their feet and the tops of their heads. Everybody is happy with this new way of making films and thinks that the filmmaker is very clever. English filmmakers are different. They know that not all the people who watch films are stupid and some of them can enjoy intelligent films. Here are some important rules you must remember if you want to make a really and truly British film. 1. The famous writer Mr. Noel Coward says that he met a man who once saw a cockney. Cockneys are people who were born in the east of London. They cannot speak good English and they cannot say the letter H, but they are kind and have big hearts. Now, all good people in films are cockneys and every British film must have a cockney. 2. Nothing is too good for a British filmmaker. He must have the best. I have heard of a man, I don't know if this story is true, but it shows how British filmmakers work, who made a film about Egypt. He built a sphinx in England. He sailed to Egypt, where there is a real sphinx, and he took his own sphinx. He was quite right to do this, because the Egyptian sphinx is very old and great filmmakers do not use anything old. Secondly, the old sphinx is good enough for the Egyptians, but the Egyptians are foreigners. British filmmakers need something better. 3. To make a good film, change the story and the people a little. Make Peter Pan, a famous children's story, into a murder story. Make the concise Oxford Dictionary into a funny film and sing all the words. Chapter 19. Driving Cars It is the same to drive a car in England as any other country. To change a car wheel in the wind and rain is as pleasant outside London as outside Rio de Janeiro. It is no more funny to try to start your car in Moscow than in Manchester. If your car stops moving anywhere, in Sydney or in Edinburgh, you will still have to push it. But the English car driver is different from the European car driver. So there are some things 
you must remember when you drive in England. 1. In English towns you must drive at 30 miles an hour. The police watch carefully for drivers who go too fast. The fight against bad drivers is very clever and very English. It is difficult to know if a police car is following you, but if you are very intelligent and have very good eyes, you will see these cars. Remember, A. The police always drive blue cars. B. Three policemen sit in each car. And C. You can read the word police in large letters on the front and back of these cars. 2. I think England is the only country in the world where you must leave your car lights on when you park your car at night in a busy street with lots of street lights. Then, when you come back to the car, you cannot start it again. The car will not work. It is dead. But this is wonderful. There are fewer cars on the road and the number of road crashes goes down. This makes the road safe. 3. Only car drivers know the answer to this difficult question. What are taxis for? A person who is walking and looking for a taxi knows they are not there to carry passengers. Taxis are on the road to teach good manners to car drivers. They teach us never to be too brave. They make us remember that we do not know what the next minute will bring for us. If we can drive down the road or if a taxi will hit us from the back or the side. 4. Car drivers are at war with other people. If you park your car in the city, the west end of London or many other places, Two or three policemen will run up and tell you, you cannot park here, move along. So where can you park? The policemen do not know. Try a place 30 miles down the road near the sea in the village of Minchinhampton, they say. Three cars can park there for half an hour on Sunday morning between 7 and 8 a.m. The police are right. Cars need to move, and move fast, not stop. Some people think that the police are wrong. They do not want to drive their cars. They think cars are built to park and not to move. These people drive out of central London, to the Great Park Hampstead Heath, or to the river at Richmond on a beautiful sunny day. They park their cars, close the windows and go to sleep. They are very uncomfortable and they sleep badly, of course. It is hot. But they say they are having a nice afternoon's holiday. Chapter 20 Three Games for Bus Drivers If you become a bus driver in England, Play these three very amusing games. 1. Drive along the street and suddenly turn right. Don't tell anybody. It is very amusing. Other drivers do not know that you are going to turn right and they crash into your big bus with their little cars. 2. Drive up to a bus stop. Hide behind a large lorry or another bus. Then, when you get to the bus stop, do not stop but drive away fast. It is very amusing to see the faces of the people who wanted to get on your bus. They are angry. They will have to wait all day for another bus. 3. If you stop the bus at the bus stop, 
drive away again quickly and suddenly. If you are lucky, people will try to get on your bus and they will fall off when you drive away. It is very amusing for the driver to see these people fall off the bus. Sometimes people fall down and get dirty or sometimes they break their leg. And they always get angry. Some people are very boring, they won't laugh at anything. Chapter 21 How to plan a town The English like to be uncomfortable. They think that this makes them strong. Only weak people from Europe live in comfortable, pleasant towns. People who build English towns want to make everything difficult. In Europe, doctors, lawyers and people who sell books have their houses and shops together in different parts of town, so you can always find a good or a bad but expensive doctor anywhere. In London your address is important. In London all the doctors live and work in Harley Street. All the lawyers are in Lincoln's Inn Fields. And all the booksellers are in the Charing Cross Road. The newspaper offices are all in Fleet Street. The people who make men's clothes are all in Savile Row. And the car salesmen are in Great Portland Street. Theatres are near Piccadilly Circus and cinemas are in Leicester Square. Soon all the fruit and vegetable shops will move to Hornsey Lane. All the butchers to the Mile End Road. And all the men's toilets to Bloomsbury. Now I want to tell you about how to build an English town. You must understand that an English town is built to make life as difficult as possible for foreigners. 1. First of all, never build a straight street. The English do not like to be able to see two ends of a street. Make bends in the streets or make them S-shaped. The letters L, T, V, Y, W and O also make good shapes for streets. It would please the Greeks if you build a few Omicron or better shaped streets. Maybe you could build streets like Russian or Chinese letters too. 2. Never build all the houses in a street in a straight line. The British are free people, so they are free to build their houses in circles. 3. Make sure that nobody can find the houses. European people put the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7 on one side of the street and 2, 4, 6, 8 on the other side of the street. The small numbers always start from the north or west. In England, they start the numbers at one end of the street then suddenly stop and continue the numbers on the opposite side, going back the other way. You can leave out some numbers and you can continue the numbers in a side street. You can also give the same numbers to two or three houses. And you can do more. Many people do not have numbers on their houses. Instead, they give their houses names. It is very amusing to go to a street with 350 houses and to look for a house called The House. Or you can visit a house called Orange Tree House and find that there are three apple trees in the garden. 4. If the road bends, give a different name to the second part of it, but if it bends a lot, so it is really two different streets, you can keep the same name. If the street is long and straight, 
give it many different names. High Holborn, New Oxford Street, Oxford Street, Bayswater Road, Notting Hill Gate, Holland Park, etc. 5. Some clever foreigners will find the street that they want, so make it harder for them. Call this street by another name. Don't just call it a street. Call it a road, way, park, garden, etc. Now try this. A. Put all the streets with the same name in the same part of town. Belsize Park, Belsize Street, Belsize Garden, Belsize Way, etc. B. Put a number of streets with the same name in different parts of the town. If you have 20 Princess Squares and 20 Warwick Roads, nobody will be able to find the right place. 6. Paint the street name in large letters on a piece of wood. Hide this piece of wood carefully. Put it very high on the wall or very low behind the flowers in someone's garden. Or in a shadow, anywhere where people cannot see it. Even better, take the street name to your bank and ask the bank to keep it for you. If you don't, Somebody will find out where they are. 7. To really worry foreigners, make four streets into squares, like this. See the picture below. In this way, it is possible to build a street which has two different names, one name for each side of it. Chapter 22. Civil Servants English civil servants are very different from European civil servants. In Europe, but not in Scandinavian countries, civil servants seem to think that they are soldiers. They shout and give you orders. When they speak, you hear the sound of guns. They cannot lose wars, so they lose their papers instead. They think the most important thing in the world is to make more jobs for more civil servants. A few difficult people, who are not civil servants, make life hard for them. They ask too many questions or they have terrible problems. European civil servants know what to do to these difficult people. They make them wait in cold and dirty waiting rooms. They make them stand up all the time and they shout at them in a rude way. If a difficult person asks for something, the civil servant always smiles happily and says no. Sometimes European civil servants play this clever little game. A difficult person goes to a civil servant's office on the third floor and asks a question. I don't know, the civil servant says. Go and ask the civil servant in the office on the fifth floor. The difficult person goes to the office on the fifth floor and asks the question again. I don't know, the civil servant on the fifth floor says. Go to the office on the second floor. The difficult person goes to the office on the second floor and asks the question again. Go to the third floor, the civil servant on the second floor says. So the difficult person goes back to the office on the third floor and speaks to the same civil servant in the same office again. But I told you to go to the fifth floor, the first civil servant shouts. The difficult person goes to the fifth floor and another civil servant sends him back to the second floor. Round and round and round. European civil servants play this game all day until the difficult person is tired 
and goes home or goes mad and asks someone to take him to a hospital for mad people. If this happens, the civil servant says, Not here. Go to the office on the second floor. So the difficult person doesn't want to go to hospital and goes home. But in England, civil servants are different. They do not think that they are soldiers. They think that they are businessmen. They are polite and kind and always smile and say yes when somebody asks a question. So everybody leaves British civil servants in their offices and they are able to spend all day quietly reading murder stories. Why, you ask, do difficult people in Britain leave British civil servants in their offices without asking them to do any work? I will tell you. 1. British civil servants write and speak a language that nobody understands. 2. Civil servants never decide anything. They say that they will think about something or think about it again. 3. You can never find a British civil servant. Their job is to help people, but if you try to find a civil servant, in fact, he is never there. He is out on business, he is out for lunch, He's somewhere having tea or he's just out. Some civil servants are clever. They go for tea before they come back from lunch. British civil servants are always polite. Before the war, British civil servants ordered an alien to leave the country. He asked to stay a few more weeks, but they told him no, he had to leave. He stayed, and a short time later he got this letter. Dear Sir, we are very sorry to tell you that the government has looked through all your papers again and has decided that you cannot stay in this country. We are terribly sorry to tell you that you must leave in the next 24 hours. If you do not, we will have to make you leave. Your servant. In Europe, rich and important people have friends, cousins and brothers that they know who are civil servants and who help them to get everything they want. In England, If your friends and family are civil servants, they do nothing for you. This is the beautiful thing about England. Chapter 23 British Newspapers The Fact There was some trouble on the Pacific island of Cherimac. A group of ten English and two American soldiers went to the island with Captain R. L. A. T. W. Tilbury. After a short fight against the Buburuk people, they took 217 Buburuk prisoners, burned two large oil refineries, and put an end to the trouble. They then returned to their ship. How do the British newspapers tell this story? Every newspaper tells it differently. The Times One of Britain's greatest, most famous newspapers. It is important to understand that this fight was important, but it was not very important. The Buburg people were not easy to fight, but at the same time they were not difficult to fight. We are not sure of the number of Buburg prisoners, but we think it is more than 216, but not more than 218. In Parliament, a man from the government said, I can give this information about the Chernak oil refineries. 
In the first half of the year, the army and most of, but not all, the Royal Air Force burnt one half more than three times the oil that the army burnt in the same months of last year. This is seven and a half times more than the two-fifths that they burnt two years ago and three quarters more than twelve times one-sixth that they burnt three years ago. Someone jumped to his feet and asked if the government knew that the British people were worried and angry because the army went into Cherimac but not into Ragamac. The government speaker said, I have nothing to say about that, sir. I said everything when I spoke on the 2nd of August, 1892. Evening Standard, a London evening newspaper. The most interesting thing about the fight on Cheramac is Reggie Tilbury. He is the fifth son of the Earl of Bayswater. He went to Oxford University and is good at several sports. When I talked to his wife, Lady Clarice, the daughter of Lord Ellison, today she wore a black suit and a small black and yellow hat. She said Reggie was always very interested in war. Later she said, it was very clever of him, wasn't it? Perhaps you decide to write a letter to the Times about all this. Sir, about the fight on Cheramac, the great English writer John Flatt lived on Cheramac in 1693. When he was there, he wrote his famous book, The Fish. Yours, etc. The next day you will see this answer. Sir, so I'm very pleased Mr. wrote about John Flatt's book, The Fish. I write to tell you that many people like Mr. think John Flatt wrote The Fish in 1693. He started the book in 1693, but he only finished it in 1694. If you write for an American newspaper, you just say this. The Oklahoma Sun. Americans win the war in the Pacific Ocean. Chapter 24. If naturalized. The verb to naturalize shows that you must become British to be a natural person. Look at the word natural in a dictionary. It means real. So, if you are not naturalized, you are not a real person. To become a real person, you must become British. You must ask the British government to make you British. The government can say yes, or it can say no. If the government says yes and you become British, you must change the way that you think and live. You must not say the things that you think and you must look down on everything that you really are. An alien. You must be like my English friend, Gregory Baker. He is an English lawyer. He looks down on these people. Foreigners, Americans, Frenchmen, Irishmen, Scotsmen, Welshmen, Jews. Workers, poor people, businessmen, writers, women, lawyers who are too rich, lawyers who are too poor. He doesn't like his mother because she is a good businesswoman. He doesn't like his wife because he doesn't like her family. And he doesn't like his brother because he is a soldier. Gregory doesn't like his seven-year-old son because their noses are the same shape. If you are naturalized, remember 1. You must eat porridge for breakfast and say that you like it. 2. 
speak English all the time, even with other aliens. Do not speak the language of the country you came from. It is very un-English to understand or speak another language. If you must speak French, which is not too bad, then only speak it with a very bad accent. 3. Change your library at home. Only read books by English writers. Throw out famous Russian writers and buy books about English birds. Throw out famous French writers and read The Life of a Scottish Fish instead. 4. When you talk about the English, always say we. But be careful. I know a naturalized British man who repeated we Englishmen when he was talking to another young man. The young man looked at him, took his pipe out of his mouth and said quietly, Sorry, sir, but I'm a Welshman. Then he turned his back and walked away. The same naturalized British man was listening to a conversation between two English women. The Japanese have shot down 22 airplanes in the last few days, one of them said. What? Ours? the man asked the two women. The English woman looked at him coldly. No, ours, she said.